In a typical church, discussions about heavier matters might be the subject for a session in the pastor's study. This is true even in the catacomb chapel of St. Uriel, no matter how different our ministries might be from your typical parish. And let's see what we might find in a very different pastor's study. Mary Meet, blessed be. Depending on how you got here, I'm Aiden Odinson, High Priest of the Temple of Gaia, or Bishop Cal Lippitt of the Universal Episcopal Church. Either way, welcome to another session in a very different pastor's study. I don't have my collar on today, just because I didn't feel like wearing it right now. I like wearing my collar, but I Sometimes I don't. And this is a pastor's study where a pastor studies. Don't need to be dressed up any particular way for that. I promise I won't be videotaped in my pajamas. That much I promise you. But I may be dressed informally sometimes. Big deal. We're not at the sanctuary. If we were in the sanctuary or we were at the altar, I'd probably be properly vested. Regardless, today I want to talk about some interesting conflicts. There are two kinds of conflicts. There are the ones that people discuss with each other, and then there are those kind of conflicts that most people or I should say too many people, keep within themselves. And a lot of times they just don't, don't deal with the conflict, don't act on the conflict. And this, uh, this is a problem because if you keep it within yourself and don't do anything about it or with it or whatever, how are you going to get any kind of resolution? What, is the good resolution fairy going to come along and solve it for you? Probably not. And do you think that some outside force could resolve your conflicts? Probably not. And this is especially true in the case of choosing a spiritual path, or a religious path, as you wish to call it. And most people begin, of course, on the religious path that their parents are already on. It's logical. Mommy and Daddy go to a church or a synagogue or a covenstead or whatever, and the children go along. And some of the children grow up there and stay there. Well and good if that's what they want. And if it fulfills them. Wonderful. I've known people who were raised pagan, and I also know people who were raised Methodist, as a matter of fact. I know quite a few people who were, who I knew in Sunday school, were still going to the same Methodist church that I went to when I was a child. That's fine for them. That particular Methodist church, and the Methodist church in general, did not didn't offer me what I was looking for, and so I started looking. And when I turned 18, I figured I'd had the right to make my own decision, and I did. The uh, problem is, of course, a decision has to be made, and some people get inhibited by what will others think? Well, I would have to say that if you're married and you're drawn in a particular direction, it's probably a good idea to not let this be a secret from your significant others. 
yeah, if you've got if you're married, you don't want to want your spouse to be in the dark. But on the other hand, any other people, well, guess what? It's your business. Now, I don't know if anybody's spouse is going to say no or I won't go there or whatever but a marriage is a special situation but other than that so far as brothers and sisters and people you work with or people you go to school with what's it to them what is it really to them it really shouldn't be very much Of course, there's another problem that can arise, and that's when if somebody is on one path, but feels drawn to another one, especially to another one as well. In some traditions, this is no problem at all. In Wicca, for instance, if somebody wants to include Karnunos of the Celtic path in their path pantheon, which is dominated by perhaps Norse deities, Nobody w was bothered with me when I did that. No. I'd say, generally speaking, unless you're in a rather tight-knit and tight in a few other ways coven or group, probably not too many people are going to object. Wiccans and pagans have a historic habit and tradition, as a matter of fact, of not being particularly bothered about who someone else might or might not be worshipping, at least as long as they don't bother other people and their spiritual paths, which is where some people get an issue with some Christians. And that's where there is a problem with them. Some of them, not all of them, seem to think that you can only follow one path and a, f a number of people of that variety large enough that they can't be ignored seem to think that the path you follow not only had better be Christian but it had better be their variety of Christian. So. That's a problem. And you know what? Their own Bible says otherwise. Yeah. Go into the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. Psalm 95, verse 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Yeah. A great king above all gods. Now, listen to that. A great king above all gods. Well, that means that not only is there more than one god, but the person that wrote this particular psalm, which is, among other things, part of the morning prayer service in the 1928 Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church, uh, these authors that wrote it respected those other gods in their roles. The one El Shaddai, Yahweh, or whoever you want to, however you want to address him, was the top, but they recognized and respected these others. And they saw that these others were to be respected. And that's certainly compatible with the opening of the Gospel of John, which speaks of God and the Word being together at the very beginning. The very beginning. I have to stress that because I see that, the beginning that they talk about in the Gospel of John as being ahead of the beginning 
that's talked about in Exodus. Because, or, or excuse me, in Genesis. Why? Because in Genesis they talk about the world was without form. But the earth was without form and void. But apparently in some way it was. But it was without form and void. So, in the beginning. And then we go to Luke chapter 16, verse 16. Which tells us that the Old Testament books known as the Law might be obsolete for doctrine. It's worth noting in Exodus, the commandment that says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, is in Exodus, part of the law. Now, because it is where it is, it's only binding on the descendants of the people who followed Moses out of Egypt. But even then, their God insists only on top billing doesn't say that you can't have other gods, just that you won't have any gods before it. And Jesus makes reference to other paths and shows respect for them. One of the most apparent is the story of the centurion whose servant was ill. In the seventh chapter of Luke, the people of Capernaum said that the centurion loved their nation and had built them a synagogue. Oh, Claire. I... Here's little Claire. You've probably seen her before. Yeah. Came over to see our, to sit on my desk. And she often does. Anyway, in the seventh chapter of Luke, the people of Capernaum said that the centurion loved their nation and it built them a synagogue. Now, a centurion was an officer in the Roman army, the occupying Roman army. And a centurion was known as a centurion because he had command of a hundred men, which was pretty big in that sense, in those days. He would have been a career soldier and would have followed the religious principles in vogue with the Roman army to advance himself into that sort of a position. Basically, he is what we would know as a military governor. But in the telling of that same story in the 8th chapter of Matthew, Jesus speaks of the centurion's faith that he had not found so great a faith, not even in Israel. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. That's what the centurion said. And Jesus said, I've never seen such faith, not even in Israel. And then, he follows that up with something even more. He goes to say that Many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. From the east and from the west. Now a couple of things to note in 
these two versions of the same story. Nobody talks about Jesus converting the centurion. No. Jesus accepts the centurion as he is. And he speaks of people coming from the east and the west and sitting down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Sounds like these other, par other paths, other faiths, are perfectly okay in his book. So it looks like the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God as you wish to call it, doesn't require a particular membership card. And that should be a good consolation for all of us. We can concentrate on our own spiritual path and not have to worry about the color of our membership card. I think that's wonderful. You're talking about a guy who paddled around with Samaritans and healed lepers and whatever else. And healed the servant of a, an officer in the Roman army. Oh, yeah. I would say this matches perfectly well. And why not? Mary Parton, blessed be. This has been a presentation of the Wise Ones Net. Merry part and blessed be.